Good afternoon, everybody that's joining uh, for this webinar on the challenge of medical and dietary management of eczema. Um, I'm seeing that people are still logging in, so I'm going to use the first couple of minutes just to kind of uh, talk about a bit of housekeeping. So we've got two speakers this afternoon. Uh, first speaker is Dr. Helen Bruff, whom I will introduce more formally as a consultant pediatric allergist in uh, London. And the way it's going to work is that uh, first, uh, I'm just going to go through some uh, objective, aims and objectives, and you will see a presentation in front, of, uh, in front of you, and then I'll hand over to Dr. Broth. What will also happen is that I'm recording this session, um, and that's an important notice actually, so that I'd really like people not to share any personal information, so you're very welcome to send questions through but please do not send any questions through with any personal information. That's really important to us. That means also after this webinar, what will, be, uh, what will happen is on both Dr. Broth's website, uh, professional website and mine as well, the uh, webinar will be, you'll be able to uh, review it again or download it if that's what you'd like to do. So without any further ado, I'm going to share my presentation with all of you. You should see that uh, in, in front of you uh, in, a, in a minute. So give me a second and you'll see that. Uh, right. So the primary focus is on the challenge of medical and uh, nutritional or dietary management. And as I said, we've got two speakers. What I always start with when we do webinars is to make sure that we set our expectations. This, is, uh, this webinar certainly does not replace an individual consultation with a pediatric allergist or dermatologist or a registered pediatric dietitian. It's meant as a general information. We cannot in this webinar discuss individual medical uh, advice related to eczema, so it will be quite general. We will also not discuss individual advice on allergen elimination diets. We will also not discuss individual vitamin and mineral supplementation. And please, as I mentioned before, please do not share any personal information. Uh, and that includes any name or date of birth of any patients or uh, for, of your own children. But what will we cover? We want to start by understanding what is eczema and infancy, and it's really important we are really focusing on infancy, to understand the management of eczema, and that will be the medical management, to understand the risk of food allergy in eczema, the role of cow's milk in eczema, the identifying other foods that can cause problems with eczema, to understand the evidence for early introduction of specific allergens, and then how to do an elimination diet with breastfeeding, hypoallergenic formulas, when, not breast to, uh, when uh, you don't have breast milk available, what to do, solid food introduction, and lastly, vitamins and minerals. I am now going to hand you over uh, to uh, Dr. Helen Broth, who's a colleague, a friend, who's a pediatric consultant allergist in London. Thanks so much, Roseanne. I'm really delighted to be here to be able to uh, give you a presentation on uh, one, some of many different questions surrounding eczema and food allergies. So in terms of what causes eczema, uh, I wanted to start off with looking at the different things that can cause eczema. The first thing is that uh, when we see somebody in clinic, we always ask about whether the parents have got any food allergies or um, allergic rhinitis or asthma. Um, and this is very important because it gives us an understanding as to whether there is a genetic predisposition towards eczema in that child. Uh, so there are various different genetic um, uh, points that can be uh, influencing the uh, predisposition towards eczema. Um, and then there's other things in the environment that can also lead to having eczema. So we know that there are things such as um, uh, there are things such as uh, bacteria, as well as fungi, and as well as other environmental things that can cause issues for children's skin, and that can cause damage to the skin. 
uh, there are also other types of treatments that can actually harm the skin with regards to doing things like applying creams that have a high pH in them. And also there are certain detergents that can cause issues. Roseanne, I think I'm going to need you to take over my screen because there, it is jumping around a little bit in terms of, if you could go back a, a couple of slides. Okay, so this is the slide basically looking at the different forms of things that can actually lead to damage of the skin. Uh, and I've mentioned the genetic factors, I've mentioned pathogens like viruses, bacteria and fungi. And there's also some evidence that environmental exposure to foods can also increase the risk of food allergies. So let's see if that works now. So how can I best manage my child's eczema? There are some really simple things that I tell all of my patients when I see them in clinic. And these are some things that can be done without using any medical treatments. So avoiding irritants is really important in eczema. For example, bubble baths have got detergents in them and that can damage the skin barrier. But there are other things that have detergents in them like shampoos and standard uh, washing gels or soaps that can also damage the skin barrier. And if the child has already got a genetic predisposition towards eczema, then they are more susceptible to these things causing some issues with the skin. I also recommend using a non-biological washing powder using 100% cotton clothing and preventing overheating. So for example, the bath should be quite tepid uh, so that they don't overheat in the bath and they should also sleep in an environment that is not too hot. Now there are some other very important things when it comes to managing eczema, which is about how to apply moisturizers or emollients. So it's very important that before applying a moisturizer, you wash your hands so that you can remove any invisible bacteria on the skin or potentially other things on the skin, such as food, if you've just eaten something like a peanut butter sandwich. Then another thing that I often find is that parents have been given a tub with moisturizer in it and that they're putting their hand into the tub and then applying it onto the skin. And this can then increase the risk of having infections of the skin because the bacteria on the, on the parent hand goes into the pot and then this can lead to the pot actually being contaminated with many different bacteria. The other thing that you can do to avoid this is just to take a clean spoon and lift the spoon and then put that onto your hands and apply it to your child's skin. Alternatively, you can buy a cream that is in a pump form um, and this can then be applied just by pumping onto your hand and then putting onto your child's skin. Another important thing is that if you rub the moisturizers in against the direction of the hair, you can actually cause um, something called folliculitis, which is where you get little infections of the hair follicle. And so what you need to do is actually apply the emollients in a downward stream that is not going to irritate the skin um, and the hair follicle. You need to leave a thin layer, but enough to see it. And this can take up to 10 minutes to soak in. So I always tell my parents that it's important that the child's moisturizers can actually be seen on the skin and that they should look a bit like a snowman once you have put the moisturizers on. It's recommended in the NICE guidelines that around 500 grams of these moisturizers are applied per week. If you think what that is, that is actually one whole tub that you usually get, for example, of some of the ointments that you use that all up by the end of the week. So that is a lot of moisturizer to apply onto the skin. And this is just in children who have got eczema. We don't recommend putting moisturizers onto the skin of children with completely normal skin. What about topical steroids? A lot of parents are very worried about using topical steroids on their child's skin. And the, it's important to address these concerns and topical steroids can be very safe to use and very effective in the management of eczema as long as they are used in accordance to what is recommended by your doctor. So if they are applied correctly in the correct potency, they are safe to use, even in infancy. What I usually recommend is that if the child does have inflamed, red, inflamed skin, 
then you apply a thin layer of the topical steroid to the actual area that's red and inflamed and you can use a fingertip unit which is uh, there are many charts for that can be used and that you need to apply these topical steroids at least 20 minutes apart from the moisturizer or emollient. Now different people have different opinions as to whether the steroid should go first or the moisturizer but the most important thing is that it is at least 20 minutes apart and I do recommend avoiding potent topical steroids on the face, neck or groin. And whereas the moisturizer should be applied to the whole body, the topical steroids should only be applied to the areas of the skin that are red and inflamed. So what is the risk of food allergy in children with eczema? This is a picture of the allergic march. This is essentially a, a picture which shows that as a child grows up to become an adult, if they have an atopic predisposition, that means that they have a genetic predisposition towards having allergies, then they can often pass through all of these types of allergies. So in the blue line, you can see that they start with eczema and then thereafter, closely thereafter, food allergy. Following this, you have asthma, which then reduces over time and allergic rhinitis, which is the orange line, which comes on a little later and can persist into adulthood. So we know that eczema, having eczema, is, increases the risk of having food allergy. And this is a study that they did in Australia with thousands of children. They took children that were attending their immunization clinics and they recorded information about whether they had used steroid creams, whether they had used moisturizers, and what, at what age the eczema started. So you can see here that even children that have no eczema do have a risk of food allergy around three to four percent however then as you continue you can see here these children had no topical treatments these children had moisturizers only these children had over-the-counter topical steroids this is for example one percent hydrocortisone that you can get over the counter in a pharmacy and these were prescription only corticosteroids these are the ones that you would need your doctor to prescribe for you you can see that also here, we look at the age at which the eczema started. So whether that was between zero and three months, four to six months, seven to nine months, or 10 to 12 months. And so as the increase in treatment requirement goes, and also looking at when the eczema started, that is directly related to how likely it was for that child to have a food allergy. So you can see here that this looked at the number of infants or the proportion of infants that were allergic to peanut, egg white or sesame. And if I can just highlight that if the child had developed eczema from zero to three months of age and required prescription only corticosteroids, in this group in Australia, they had a 50% chance of having some form of food allergy, which was confirmed by an oral food challenge where the child is brought into hospital and given the food to eat under supervision to see if they have an allergic reaction. So the earlier the onset of the eczema and the more severe the eczema, the more likely it is for that child to have a food allergy. In the other way, we can also say that children who have no eczema until they're around two or three years of age and then start to develop eczema, their risk of having food allergy as a trigger for their eczema is very low. And this talk is focusing on eczema in infancy. So we're talking about eczema between the ages of zero and 12 months of age, which is why I'm spending a lot of my time focusing on food allergy. Whereas in older children, the link between eczema and food allergy is not so strong. So this is a study that was done in Japan and they looked at the duration of eczema and how having eczema for a longer period of time increased the risk of that child having food allergy. And you can see here that as the child had eczema for a longer period of time, whether it was one month, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10 or 11 months, so the percentage of patients had more and more food allergy. So if a child had eczema 
for eight months or more, they had an over 50% chance of having a food allergy. And this was again, based on food challenges. So it's very important to think about how long the child has eczema and also important to know that managing a child's eczema is very important because the longer the eczema goes on, the more likely it is that that child will develop food allergy. So how does it happen? What happens to the skin to develop this food allergy? So if you look at this diagram, if you look at the first stage, we've talked about this already, where you have environmental pollutants, detergents, infections in a child that has a predisposition towards allergy. This then leads to an impaired skin barrier function. So this leads to damaged skin because the child's skin is more susceptible to this because of their genetic predisposition. Then because the skin is damaged already, you can have bacteria and irritants entering and this can lead to skin inflammation. This is the red, uh, the red patches that you can see in eczema. And this is then where you get the diagnosis of clinical atopic dermatitis, which is eczema. And then you can have two different ways in which this is uh, linked to food sensitization and allergy. So just having dry skin and impaired skin barrier and also having clinical eczema can increase the risk of food sensitization and allergy. Now sensitization is where you have a positive allergy test to a food, but we don't know if you are allergic or not. Allergy is where you have a clinical reaction to the food with, for example, hives or swelling. One of the immediate type reactions to food is what this is talking about. And there is evidence that environmental exposure to food allergens, for example, in dust, and the major piece of work that has been done has been on peanut allergens in dust, can increase the risk of peanut allergy if the child has impaired skin barrier function or eczema. So can food allergy be prevented? So there was a very important study that was published in 2015. This was the learning early about peanut study. And in this study, they took children that were between the age of four months and 11 months of age, and they either had severe eczema or egg allergy. So they already had around 30% risk of developing peanut allergy because we know that these are risk factors for peanut allergy. And then they had a group that had a negative skin prick test to peanut, that was here, and a group that had a positive skin prick test to peanut between one and four millimeters. And then they combined these, both of these groups into one to look at them together. Then half of the children, and these were 640 children, were randomized to avoiding peanut until they were five years of age. And the other half were asked to introduce peanut at high doses from the age of when they came into the study until they were assessed at the end of the study at five years of age. And you can see here that in the avoidance group, the children that were avoiding peanut had around a 14% chance of peanut allergy in those that had a negative skin prick test at the beginning of the study. However, those that were in the consumption group had a much lower amount of peanut allergy. And this was an 86% reduction in the risk of peanut allergy. If we look at the group that were already on their way to becoming allergic to peanut, so they had a skin prick test of one to four millimeters, you can see that in the avoidance group, 35% of these children developed peanut allergy. So in a child that has a low positive skin prick test, avoidance of peanut can lead to an increased risk of peanut allergy with a 35% risk. Those in the consumption group had a much lower risk of peanut allergy with a 70% reduction in peanut allergy. And overall, what is quoted from the paper is that overall in the study, there was an 81% reduction in peanut allergy in the group of children that were eating peanut from early on. Now this has been uh, combined with other studies that have looked at peanut uh, and egg allergy, but also other foods. And this is an early feeding guideline from uh, the BSACI, which is the British Society for Allergy and Clinical Immunology. 
And in this uh, algorithm, you can see here that they outline what to do in terms of introducing foods into a child's diet. So at the top, it says that the UK health departments advise exclusive breastfeeding until around six months of age and to continue breastfeeding throughout the first year. Now I'm going to start here in the arm that is orange and green. So these are children with a low risk of having a food allergy. This is infants with a household member with food allergy because actually it's been shown that it is not a, a big increased risk for food allergy or those with no risk factors for food allergy. So the important thing about families where there's somebody who already has an allergy is that you need to make sure that you introduce the food where the other person who's allergic isn't likely to have an allergic reaction. So for these groups, it says, when the baby is ready, introduce solid foods at around six months of age, but not before four months, including peanut, egg, and other foods that are eaten as part of the family's normal diet. And here they say screening allergy tests are not routinely recommended prior to introducing solids. However, if the child does have a known risk factor for food allergy, and that is eczema or existing food allergy in the baby, then they should avoid the foods that they know that the baby is allergic to. And then it says here that these children may benefit from earlier introduction of cooked egg and then peanut alongside other foods. When the baby is ready, and that means that the baby is able to sit uh, with head control, so they have to have some head control even if they need some support to be seated, and they need to be able to accept the food into their mouth. Then you would consider introducing solid foods, including cooked egg and then peanut from four months of age, followed by other allergenic foods. And this uh, algorithm is free to download for parents. So how do we know if food allergy is being driven, uh, driving eczema? So I've shown you that children with eczema have an increased risk of developing immediate food allergies. For example, allergies that cause hives and swelling, like peanut allergy. But also sometimes in eczema, some food allergies can be making the eczema worse. So there's a nice uh, guideline on this called atopic eczema in children. And in that, they, they talk about the clues to food allergy in eczema. These are an atopic family history, early onset of eczema, severity of eczema and I, I hope you remember the slide from before where I showed you that the children that had earlier onset particularly between zero and three months of age and those that required prescription only corticosteroids thus had more severe eczema at more risk of this. Also resistance to treatment so for example standard moisturizers and standard topical steroids if the if the treatments are not working then it's something to think about Gastrointestinal symptoms like um, loose stools or severe colic or reflux in association with uh, these other factors can also increase the risk that food allergy might be contributing to the eczema. And then also faltering growth, which I know um, Roseanne uh, will be able to go into. And so in this guideline, uh, they recommend that if moderate to severe eczema is not controlled by optimal treatment, that the family consider doing an exclusion of cow's milk because this is the food that predominantly is associated with eczema during infancy, although it can sometimes be other foods. So the recommendations are that breastfed infants uh, may be considered for a trial of an allergen specific exclusion diet to cow's milk in particular, and this should be done under dietary supervision if food allergy is strongly suspected. And this will be discussed further by Roseanne. In bottle-fed infants, a six to eight week trial of an extensively hydrolyzed formula, that's EHF, or an amino acid formula, that's AAF, in place of cow's milk formula may be considered. And then soya formula can be offered to children over the age of uh, six months. But again, further information will follow on this. So to summarize, uh, there are many very straightforward things that can be done to manage eczema. The first thing is to avoid irritants uh, and detergents. The second thing is to apply the moisturizers correctly and particularly to wash hands before applying moisturizers. 
We know that children with eczema are much more likely to develop food allergy. And so it's very important to manage the child's eczema. We know that food allergy can sometimes cause eczema and gut issues. And there are some useful documents uh, from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which I've alluded to before. And there's been some recent data in the last five to six years, which has shown that introducing solids earlier in at-risk children, uh, so for example, I mentioned those with eczema or another food allergy as per the BSACI guidelines, that introduction of these foods from four months of age has been shown to be able to prevent food allergy. So I'd like to hand over now to Roseanne Meyer to do the next part of the presentation. Uh, this is just some information about me. And if you want some more information about uh, why am I allergic, this is a podcast that you could listen to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen, for that uh, extensive background. Um, and I hope it shows how important it is when uh, any dietary intervention is done that we do it together with an allergist um, because the dietary management is so intrinsically linked to what the skin management is. So I think the first principle from a dietary management in regards to inf uh, infancies is avoid just the allergens you've been advised to avoid. I think one of the biggest problems I see is that I get families with children with eczema who are on huge elimination diets. And it's normally just a small group of culprit foods, as Helen has already alluded to, you know, your, your a peanut, your egg, and your cow's milk. Uh, if you're doing an elimination diet, so if we're embarking on it, then the avoidance diet needs to be complete. It's not worth saying, okay, I'm avoiding cow's milk, but I'm having cake and I'm having some cheese every now and again. For it actually to impact, if we're suspecting it as a culprit, it really needs to be complete. In particular, if it's a case of uh, us being in the diagnostic phase where we are eliminating and then uh, reintroducing to see if it makes a difference. Then also an important to keep those communication channels open. If you think eczema makes, there's a specific food that makes the eczema worse, it's important to discuss it with your allergist and to your dietitian because as I already alluded to, is that it's usually a small group of common allergens that really are involved. You've already heard there might be situations, depending on the symptoms that your child might be having, where testing may be uh, possible. It may also be that the symptoms are totally uh, delayed, where testing may not be in indicated, in which case your test is the elimination diet followed by a reintroduction. I'm a strong believer in deciding on a plan together. So meaning that we discuss with our parents together with the allergist, which foods we are going to eliminate and also how we're going to reintroduce because eczema, as you've already heard from Helen, can flare up because of other uh, issues. So it's important that we all agree what the plan is and that the plan fits in with the skin management regime suggested by the doctor. Uh, and as a dietitian, of course, if we take something out, there needs to be a nutritional uh, replacement that might be just a food or it might be a supplement. So I want to explain that when as a dietitian, I'm thinking about elimination diet, I don't think oh, we're just taking out milk. I'm thinking about the protein, the energy, the vitamins, the minerals that we're taking out. Um, and so for every food, and although it might feel initially that these may not make a huge difference, in an infant, milk is a primary source of nutrients. So taking milk out or not replacing it properly has a huge uh, nutritional uh, impact. Although it might, you might think, okay, nuts does not make a huge difference. Actually, nuts contribute significantly, not only to energy, but they have some essential fatty acids in some of the nuts and also have some really great micronutrients that can contribute. So my message here is, is that we can, when you take something out, it can have a nutritional impact. So therefore we need to replace or supplement if need be. The first part of call is always thinking about breastfeeding because of course, as you've already seen, we want to support breastfeeding as far as possible. And here, uh, the first important message is to, again, only eliminate the foods that really make a difference. The reason for that is that although carbohydrates, protein, and total fat, and those do not generate change, uh, irrespective of what the mother's diet is. There are other nutrients that make a difference. I want to put a caveat in 
unless the mother is really malnourished. So, of course, if a mother is really malnourished, then, then um, breast milk production in terms of your carbohydrate and protein content does change. But if a mother is deficient of thiamine, vitamin E, vitamin D, breast milk content is lower. And in particular, the type of fat that is consumed, so not the total fat, but the type of fat, so your omega-3, 6, and 9 levels are really highly influenced by the maternal diet. That does not only have an anti-inflammatory effect, but actually some of these fats are really important for uh, cognitive, so brain development, eye uh, development, all of those type of things really important to take into account. Then it's a nutrient that our colleagues from some of the countries really remember, but often us in developed countries, iodine is forgotten, but iodine actually is, is a, the breast milk is also highly influenced by the maternal diet. So many countries, iodine, you have a national supplementation, but for example, in the UK, we do not have a national supplementation. And actually the cows are fed with iodine rich foods. So actually, if we in the UK take iodine out, uh, sorry, cow's milk out, iodine often drops. And there are already studies showing that iodine drops in breast milk if you don't have cow's milk. So that's an important nutrient to take into account. So the message from my side is if you take something out, even if you're breastfeeding, and if even if somebody says to you, okay, your breast milk doesn't change, it actually makes a difference. Then as a dietitian and also for a doctor, our duty of care is not only towards the baby, it's towards the parent, the mother. And so we also need to be thinking of the nutritional status of the mother. What for me sends huge alarm bells if a mother comes to me and saying, I'm taking all eight allergens out, in addition to tomato and citrus and all of these, I've lost already 14 kilograms on my weight now is pre-pregnancy and I had vitamin D deficiency. So that for me, uh, I'm really concerned about because uh, if the mother's nutritional status is not good, it does affect also the breast milk content. So what about vitamins and minerals during uh, uh, supplementation during breastfeeding? Of course, the ideal for me is always that you get an individualized uh, uh, information on that and, and that it's based on what you're actually eliminating. If you don't have access, then I would always suggest to avoid mega dosages. What does it mean, a mega dosage? When you look at a supplement, you will always see a number, microgram my, uh, or milligram or uh, uh, international units, and then next to you, it would say 50%, 80%, 100% of RDA, RNA, um, or DA, so that's dietary allowance, recommended nutrient intake. So what you want ideally is not go well above 100%. Because excessive intake of these vitamins, in particular your fat-soluble vitamins, has also shown not to be beneficial. In particular for cow's milk, which is a primary culprit, we think about calcium. So calcium recommendation varies slightly between countries. In the UK, it's, uh, it's 1,200 milligram. Um, and it is just not sufficient to say, okay, I'm having some milk replacement, my coffees and teas. That is not going to do it. So you need much more than that. So often we need supplementation and often this may need to be combined with vitamin D just to remind ourselves that during uh, in the Northern Hemisphere between October and May, your UV rays are not sufficient and do not convert uh, sufficient uh, uh, vitamin D uh, in the skin. And then we need to think about iodine, depending on where you're coming from. Vegan veganism, vegetarian, is quite in at the moment. That doesn't mean it's bad. But for me as a dietitian, it means we need to not only think about these nutrients, we need to be thinking about what about iron, vitamin B12. If you're vegan, we might need to be thinking about omega-3 fatty acids as well. Now, if breast milk is not available or insufficient, meaning you need to do a bit of a top up, I often get the question, what are the alternatives? So the alternatives in particular that we're going to focus on is extensively hydrolyzed formula, as you already heard, EHF or an amino acid formula. Rice formulas are available in some other countries, in the UK not, but in Europe, mainland Europe, they are also available and they're seen as hypoallergenic as well and suitable to be used. Now, a question I always get is, what is the best one to use? The reality is, 
in the EU and those also outside of the EU, the companies have a very strict criteria in regards to ingredients. So that means the amount of protein, the amount of carbohydrates and fats, and the amount of vitamins, really there is a set amount that they need to have. There's slight variation, a couple of milligram above, a couple of milli a microgram or milligram below, and then there might be other. So some products may have some probiotics, some prebiotics, so they might have slight fat variation. But in fact, for the vast majority, they, there's not a huge amount of room for maneuver. So in regards to nutrients, they're actually very similar outside of some of the additions that you may have. More, very important that all formulas suitable for the treatment of cow's milk allergy have to be tested. So, uh, and that's an important message for parents is to talk to your healthcare professionals because they will know which ones are tested. You really do not want to be using those that have not been tested in children with allergies. So what are the differences in hypoallergenic formulas? Um, there's an amino acid formula. So the amino acid formula, they contain only amino acids. So they don't contain any cow's milk at all. We're an extensively hydrolyzed formula. Extensively hydrolyzed means that the protein or the peptides are chopped up into peptides that the body does not recognize as an allergen. So it's still based on cow's milk, but it's based on the broken down pieces. And it can be either based on the casein, so the curd or the whey, which is the, the more uh, liquid part of it. So can, you can get both of them. You can also get extensively hydrolyzed formulas with or without lactose. Now remember, lactose is the carbohydrate of cow's milk. So when uh, uh, Helen spoke about cow's milk being a problem, it's not the lactose we're talking about, it's the protein in particular. So you can get uh, feeds that also contain lactose. You might get feeds for prebiotics, probiotics, type of fat sources, and slightly different uh, vitamin and mineral content. In the ideal world, it, this should always be guided by a healthcare professional to make the best choice because as a dietitian and also as doctors, we'd be immediately, if we've got a patient in front of us, we'd be thinking what would work best, what is our experience, where is the evidence as well. But I know you want some general guidelines and you want to have something to take away from this webinar. So for the vast majority of children, they will tolerate an extensively hydrolyzed formula. So those are the, they are based on cow's milk, but they chopped up into peptides. So most of the children will start on them. But for those children with growth faltering, which we really worry about if they're, they're not growing very well, especially if they've got multiple foods, allergies affecting the skin. And as you already heard, they could have gut symptoms as well for those your healthcare professional may start with an amino acid formula as a first, uh, first feed. In children where an extensively hydrolyzed formula is not tolerated, so you see ongoing eczema and you can see that it's not resolving, especially if the doctor or the dietitian has a strong suspicion that it's cow's milk, then we may switch over to an amino acid formula. An important message to come out today is to allow enough time for your baby to settle on the formula before changing. I often get an email within the first three to four days and say, yep, Roseanne, this is not my, uh, uh, working. I want to change to a different formula. So that's in particular for eczema, very important is, um, is that the skin can go up and down and you might get some patches that flare up. That's not always a formula that is. So we need to have enough time for it actually to really settle. And if you've got gut symptoms on top of that, you really want enough time on a formula. And it normally takes three to four weeks before we really see a good impact and we, before we can say this is working or not working. I did want to uh, touch on soya formula because I know we have people logging in today for this webinar who are not necessarily from um, European countries. So I first of all want to explain, in Europe, none of the official guidelines suggest soya formula below the age of six months. This is currently being reviewed, but part of the reason is that in the past there were ex uh, uh, concerns expressed about the phytoestrogen. But we now know with some of the prospective data that that concern is not really so significant because the type of estrogen does not get converted to the active estrogen. So in terms of IgE-mediated allergy, it's below 13% in children react also to soya. So this can be tested with a skin protest. So those are the immediate type allergies. 
In non-IgE mediated allergy, and I want to really highlight the data that I'm quoting here comes mainly from the UK, USA, up to 50% of children uh, with cow's milk allergy also have a soya allergy. So non-IgE means those are delayed and often affect, can affect the gut and the skin. We have countries like, for example, Israel and Japan have come back to us and saying we've not seen the data. So it's important to actually look at the data from which country it comes from. So it can be very useful for after at the age of six months, uh, if a child is soya negative on, uh, on skin prick test, useful also if parents want to have a vegan source and the child is not allergic. And for those of you dialing in from uh, countries where you can't afford, I would definitely, uh, if you think that, it's a, uh, that there's no other formula to trial, of course, soya formula can be trialed. So what about tips in terms of introduction of hypoallergenic formula? Because the most common complaint I get is the taste is awful. In babies below the age of six months, it's generally easier as they taste naive. So I normally would say, just go for it, just switch it over. And I know it's going to sound really mean, but actually thirst is a primary driver for introduction. So really getting going with just switching it over and offering it often just is the key for getting it in. In babies above the age of six months where solid foods have been introduced, they are getting more taste uh, um, aware, so they can taste better between bitter, sour, so they can often be a bit more astute to taste changes. So first advice is be consistent. So offer the hypoallergenic formula and, and be consistent with offering it. Offer when your baby is hungry. If your baby's already in solid foods, try to mix it with the formulas. You can use alcohol free, and this is important because most of the vanilla essence actually contains alcohol. So if you want to use an alcohol free vanilla essence, it alters the smell, but it doesn't alter the taste. So it will take that version of it, but the taste will still be the same. In my population of really, if you're really not successful, and I looked at my data, it's about 5% with motivation that are really not successful. You can use a milkshake flavoring. There are plenty of milkshake flavoring that are natural that, uh, that do not have artificial flavoring in and are actually milk-free and soya-free. But what I normally do is I start it. If a child starts to uh, accept the formula, I immediately start to cut back because it will contain sugar and we wanna be thinking about the teeth as well. I do get the question about honey. Please do not use honey below the age of one because honey contains botulism and it can, in rare occasions, cause a, a, an, a, an infection and, and, and severe diarrhea. So if you ha have breast milk available, you can mix breast milk with your hypoallergenic formula, but mix it just before feeding because breast milk contains amylase, which is a really, uh, it's a, an enzyme that is, uh, is actually working within the breast milk. So if you mix it long beforehand, it actually starts digesting some of the carbohydrates. So the, we call it the osmolality. So the particles go up. So it actually empties the stomach then uh, slower. If your baby has a delayed non-IgE mediated allergy, and this is important, it's not for the immediate type. For the immediate type, you want to just switch. For delayed type, you can actually take your time and mix it slowly over time. So what about solid food introduction in babies with eczema? So as you already heard, solid food introduction between four and six months based on allergy prevention advice. So you can really introduce from the time, but you need to assess all motor skills. Helen has already gone through, you know, sitting and having head control. You really don't want to introduce if you don't have any head control. And it's important not to force food into a baby. If your baby is not ready, then your baby is not ready. You have this window when you want to see, because what the worst thing is to do it is that food actually becomes a stressful experience. And we are, by trying to get foods in early, we're try getting feeding difficulties. You can try with finger foods just as a taste, uh, with your finger, sorry, as just as a taste, just to see if it's going and see how the tongue thrust is going. It's normal to have a, you know, kind of a, star, a strong tongue thrust initially, but that normally, uh, as time goes with feeding, that goes away and the baby starts learning a lateral tongue movement. Start offering a small amount, I normally say one to two teaspoons once a day, and let your baby guide you with volume. Responsive feeding, I do a session on feeding itself, but responsive feeding is what you want to do. There are no portion sizes for babies below the age of one. 
length of time of trialing new foods. We've had a Congress recently, there was a huge debate. Is it one day, is it three days, is it five days, is it just one week? So the first aspect really is we want to expand the diet. We know expanding the diet is positive. So what you want to do is getting diversity in. That's good for the gut bacteria. However, in eczema, and in particular for the gut symptoms, I like to have a system. Because what we do want to do is we want to expand. We want to know that foods are not culprits. I've been in situations too often where so many foods are blamed for eczema, where actually it's not the food, where, but we've just gone so fast, we do not understand what are the foods anymore. So in my world, what I start off is I start with three days. We just set for the first set of foods, see how that is going. We build up the confidence for the parents, and then we start speeding up the introduction. For allergens, I normally provide parents with a regime of introducing, um, and that includes peanuts and egg and all of those, and those will normally, I do three days. If you're doing ladders, they take often a bit longer. So what uh, I really, uh, I try to individualize that and talk to the doctor how quickly and how quickly that window is for introductions. Here, I'm whizzing through that, it's just a quick guidance on how to introduce foods, uh, cow's milk and foods, full cream yogurts, that's generally not a problem. Um, uh, at this age, remember below the age of one, you do not want to give uh, milk, so just pasteurize cow's milk as a drink, as a main drink. It can be in food, but not as a main drink. Egg, now you've heard already, egg and peanut are the ghost ones that you really ideally want to bring in early. That's where the evidence is. Now, what I normally do, and I know it sounds disgusting, but when you do it early, the texture of egg can be difficult. So I often scramble it or boil it and then puree it and mix it with foods. It works really well. For those of you who are healthcare professionals, the EAT study, they've got wonderful recipes there and they work really well. For peanut, I normally use a peanut butter and I thin it with a bit of water and I mix it. You can, of course, use the peanut puffs if you've got a child above the age of six months. Wheat, shellfish, sesame, so tahini, those generally are not a problem to get in. Uh, and those we start introducing from six months of age, unless you're advised by your allergist not to do. Important message. Once it has been introduced, it needs to remain in your diet. Please do not go whoopee, I love it. This is, my child has got the peanut and you just stop. Once it's in there, we aim for twice a week to be in there. I'm going to give you a regime in a minute. Here's just a possible sequence. Now it's very easy. I've got a between four and six months and that's six months. Although it looks very similar, you'll see I start normally with some root vegetables but the difference here is at six months, your iron stores and a full-time baby, you need to have additional iron that comes from food. So the difference between my, between four and six months and six months, I bring the protein that's iron rich and early. And then you can see here, I bring in peanut egg and all of those things earlier because um, we have, we really want to get it in and our eczema children at six months. At four to six months, we've got some time, we bring some other foods in here. And it's really important if you're vegetarian to think about combining vitamin C with your iron rich sources. So what I often end up with families is deciding because it's like, okay, what do I do? So I kind of work with them on a regime where we kind of mix the nut butters together, where we kind of say, okay, that goes into your porridge. Sometimes we have some eggy toast, we bring some peanut puffs, we have some hummus and fish. So although it seems like quite complex, you can easily come up with a regime in over one week, uh, have a nice regime where you've got all of your allergens in, in particular your nut butters and also your egg in there as well, your wheat, your fish as well. In the last two minutes, I'm just quickly going to whiz through. I'm not sure if my baby reacted to a food common, common scenario with eczema. And you've already heard from Helen that there are factors outside of food allergens. I know food is the common one we like to blame, but outside of food allergens, there are often factors that can impact on the skin. So as a dietitian, unless it was very clear, I often ask, have you changed the skin uh, products? Is there new clothing? Is it very hot? So those type of aspects need to be taken into account. I also take into account that once they start drooling and dribbling, you know, and at seven, eight months of age, 
this area often becomes extremely dry. So they eat messy. So if you get apple puree or fruit around this, they often become really red around that area. So that doesn't mean they've got an allergy to apple. That's just local because they've become messy. So it's important to have a chat to your doctor involved is what can you do if you've got a really a big dribble rash here, because clearly that is going to become irritated if a particular fruit comes around it. For food to be an allergen, the reaction needs to be repeated. So as a dietitian, I often go, let's stop, let's retry. Stop, retry. If the food is a very clear reaction, go back to your allergist, go back to your dietitian and say, okay, I'm seeing a reaction so that we can actually verify that if we need to verify it. And if it's an important allergen that we also can replace it. Lastly, vitamin and mineral supplementation. You've heard this before, if your baby is breastfed, then daily drops of 10 micrograms of vitamin D is recommended that. The WHO recommends that, most countries recommend that. And follow your local guidelines. Because you know, you hear from my accent, I know in South Africa, vitamin A is also recommended. So see where you're from and say, okay, this is the baseline. Your eczema child should not be treated like any other child. And then you say, okay, what are we eliminating? As a rule of thumb, if your baby's on a hypoallergenic formula, most formulas at 600 milliliters provide sufficient vitamin D and calcium, but check with your dietitian. You, it's often the assumption that the foods come from uh, foods, but this ideally needs to be checked. And the more foods that are eliminated, you already see the more nutrients we take out. So if your baby's a difficult feeder, then speak to your dietitian for personalized advice. But again, like with a breastfeeding mom, avoid mega dosages. So avoid going above 100% of whatever your micronutrient is, because, uh, unless you're advised to do so. So I'm going to finish off to give you also time to send in your questions. Uh, I've not seen in questions coming in yet. My conclusion is do not just eliminate foods in eczema there are nutritional consequences. So you want to chat to somebody that knows. Do targeted elimination. So if it's IgE mediated, so an immediate type, let your allergist guide you through when to introduce and when to eliminate. That's really important. If it's a non-IgE mediated, then a reintroduction at home can occur. Your dietitian can inform you how you do it. You want to know really how to do it. Do not delay food allergen uh, introduction beyond six months of age and think about early introduction of peanut and egg, and this needs to be considered an eczema. Food introduction ideally should occur in a systematic way to be able to follow any reactions. So what you don't want is to get a situation where you just blame food and you need to be thinking that food could be a factor, especially if it's younger children, but the older the child becomes, the lower the risk of an association. So that's an important one. If food is involved in eczema, the reaction is reproducible. And ideally to discuss this reaction with your allergist. So whilst you're thinking about questions, uh, I'm going to just go back to, uh, and like with um, uh, Dr. Broth, you can also go onto my Facebook and my website for further webinars. I'm going to stop sharing so that you can see our faces 